just alluded to this earlier that he really taught me, and I, I try to emulate every day, be nice. You know, when you walk into a room, Coach Reedy, when he walked in, the great big smile, the great big handshake, he, he's like you knew him forever. So number one, always be nice. Number two, be respectful. And in the banking world, you, you've got to be kind of respectful most of the time. And, he, and even in 1986, when the Mets won the World Series, and I thought the Abbey was going to burn down from all the Northerners down here. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coach the next day said, you've got to be respectful. So I, I, I remember that to this day. And then li lastly, and I've other, others have said this, is help others. Our biggest joy was probably in the pool with the kids from the Holy Angels. Special Olympics. I still remember when they would come in the gym. They would all go, coach, coach, coach. And, and, they, and a lot of those kids could not even walk. But when they got into the water, they had the ability to do things that were just special. So be nice, be respectful, help others. My name is uh, Clint Bryant. Um, I graduated in 1977, came in, came in 1973. And uh, Coach Reedy was a basketball coach then. He was assistant coach under Bob Hussey. Now, those of you who were here in 1973, it was the first time we had women attend the college. Moe's here tonight. And, um, and Belmont, North Carolina, wasn't the end of the world, but you could see it. <laughs> um, a boy out of Washington, D.C. coming to Belmont Abbey was, was a stretch. So uh, Coach Reedy, special, special guy. Now, you got to understand, in 1973, Mike Reedy could still really, really play basketball. I mean, NBA could play basketball. And what Coach Reedy would do, when you were a freshman, he'd play you one-on-one -on -one before every practice. And the guys told me, he said, now, once you beat him, he'll never play you again. Yep, so enough, it took me about two and a half months, and I finally beat him. And he said, oh, no, but I own the record, so we'll never play again. So we didn't. So a couple of quick stories. Bonnie remembers this. Uh, we had a freshman team, and we were all about six or seven strong. We go down to USC Spartanburg, which I think they call upstate now, but they were a junior college. And we played Spartanburg Methodist North Greenville, and we were the fourth team. We go down there six strong. We, don't, we can't even have a layup line. We got three guys on one side, three guys on the other, and they're laughing at us. They're laughing at us. Well, we win by 30. <laughs> the next night, we come back for the championship game against USC Spartanburg, and at that time, I think the colors now are green and, 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 and white, but back then, the colors were purple and yellow, and the coach had on a purple, sh purple suit yellow tie, purple shirt, and yellow shoes. And we won by 40. And uh, on the way back, Coach Reedy was just laughing and laughing. I said, well, Coach, don't we deserve a hamburger? Now? Oh, no, the, the, the cafeteria opens tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock to get it in. <laughs> and then the, then, 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 then the last story is that uh, a guy named Craig Leach from Raleigh, North Carolina. Bonnie, I talked to Craig about two and a half months ago. He was on the team. So Coach Reedy said, I need some help moving. So will you and Craig help me move? I said, yes, coach, we'll help you move. I'll be the pick up at 5.30 in the morning. 5.30 in the morning. We worked from 5.30 in the morning to 7.30 at night. He didn't give us lunch. He worked our <laughs> butt off. The next thing I know, I said, Coach Reed, he said, now, for all the work you guys give, did, uh, I'm going to buy you guys a nice steak dinner. Well, today I'm still waiting on that step. <laughs> In 1973, when I came here, I've never left a college campus since then. I'm the athletic director now at Augusta University and have been there for the past 34 years. And there was never a year that the phone wouldn't ring and it'd be Coach Reedy. Just want to check on you, how things going. He was that type of man. He was a mentor. Uh, my tennis coach now, Michael McGrath, played here. Uh, my head basketball coach, Dip Mitras, played here. Uh, we had the great opportunity this past regional to play Belmont Abbey in the regional uh, tournament. 
the first round of the regional tournament. We went on to play in the national championship game. But I remember someone asked me, well, how does it feel to play your alma mater? I said, no matter what, I don't lose tonight. And no matter what, Coach Reedy never lost. I'm Neil Stiers. I'm, I'm just an old friend. Um, one of the problems with being last is you sort of have to adjust on the fly so you can have those. Uh, Dr. Dempsey, I, I had the pleasure of hearing Bobby Crimmins uh, give the uh, keynote address when Mike was uh, inducted into the Gaston County Sports Hall of Fame. I didn't understand a word he said. He talked just like Mike. Uh, and then I have to correct a few things. Uh, Dennis the story I heard about the eagles was it's hard to soar like eagles when you're surrounded by a bunch of turkeys. <laughs> and, and Bonnie alluded to a story, uh, two stories. One was the neighbor uh, that, that came out about the dog. I have to tell you that one first. But Mike, Lu Mike doesn't know tell jokes. He told stories. And when he would approach you, it was two words, good story. And you knew it was coming. And if it was a really good story, he'd say, good story, swear to God, good story. So you know it was really coming. And I, couldn't have, I could not tell you about Tim Buck, too. 30 minutes after that, he told that joke. We were still, Bonnie's laughing now. I could not possibly tell that joke. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the story about Mike and his mechanical abilities, because I want to talk about his driver's license and, and all, his, uh, all the great physical attributes that he had around the house. When Mike was bad, he was terrible. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't mean that ugly. I mean, he couldn't do anything in the house. And <laughs> the neighbor, one day, he, uh, when, after they, Bonnie and him moved in, they had a ready-made lawn. Nice garden, nice trees, bushes, and, and a lot of grass. Nice green grass. Mike had never seen a lawnmower, let alone own a lawnmower. <laughs> he goes next door to the same neighbor that helped bury the dog. And he's a nice southern guy, and, he, and, and Mike asked, can I, can I borrow your lawnmower? Well, the guy was like, yeah, yeah, you can go him a long more. So Mike pushes it back over to his yard, looks at that thing, and he decides, okay. He goes back over to the neighbor, and he says, how is it you start this thing? <laughs> so the neighbor, being the nice southern gentleman, he, he showed Mike, he cranked it for him, showed him how to do it, cranked it for him, and Mike was on his way back to his yard. The neighbor leaves, runs an errand, whatever, he's gone. He tells Mike, just, just put it in the garage when you get through. So the neighbor leaves. Mike goes and cuts the grass. Bonnie's laughing again. She, but Mike goes, cuts the grass, brings the lawnmower back home. Neighbor comes home, and there's the lawnmower sitting next to the tree. It's not in the garage. So he, he gets out of the car, and as he approaches the lawnmower, it's still running. <laughs> Mike comes running over. He said, thanks for letting me use it. I just didn't know how to cut it off. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. She alluded to this uh, about the, the, the commode issue. When I walked in tonight, there's an article out there that Mike wrote when he was writing for the Gazette, and it was Handyman Mike. There's not a word of it true. This is how it goes. Saturday afternoon, June the 6th, 1996, I get a phone call at my house. I'm standing in the kitchen, and I'm, I pick up the phone, and I hear the sound of running water. And then I hear Mikey's voice. I never called, where, where's Dennis? I never called him coach. It was Mikey. Two grown men, he called me Neely. But here's what I could hear other than the water. He says, Neely, I got a problem. I said, Mike, is that water running? Yeah. I said, well, Mike, what's the problem? He said, well, you know how hard it is to get the commode seat nuts off when, it, when it's tight and whatnot? I said, no, all you need is a good adjustable wrench. He said, didn't have a wrench. I said, well, Mike, you could use a set of pliers. I, I didn't have pliers. I said, Mikey, what did you have? Hammer. <laughs> I said, Mikey, don't you know that that china is like glass and it breaks just like glass? Do now. <laughs> I said, Mikey, why'd you call me now? I didn't know how to turn the water off. True story, swear to God, true story.
There we go. Um, I had a different relationship with Doc than probably everybody else in here. Um, those of you that are involved in coaching know or heard the worst thing you can do is to follow a legend. I had to follow the legend. I took over as Belmont Abbey's tennis coach in 2001. Um, an enviable job. His shoes could not be filled. But I'd heard these stories about him. I never met the man. All of a sudden, I walk into the cafeteria, first day of classes, and I hear this. I can't do the Bronx accent. Where's the new coach? Um, he couldn't have been nicer to me. Every morning, um, Father Chris, the women's soccer coach, Scott Whelan, the baseball coach, Kermit Smith, and myself would have coffee. We just talked about life. I had only been married a couple years. One of the first things he said to me, take time for your wife. Take time for your wife. Never forgot it. Um, the only other story I'll say is one time he had, this is the competitive side of him, we went out to Southampton to play doubles. He brought me out there. I have no idea who we played, it really doesn't matter. I was a little younger, a little better shape. We were warming up and I'm hitting the ball and Mike looks at me and he goes, I thought you were good. <laughs> and I said, what, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you're barely hitting the ball. I said, well, I'm, I thought we were here for fun. He goes, look, this is fun, but if we lose to these guys, you are not gonna have fun. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, we didn't lose. We didn't lose. Um, I thank you all for having me here tonight. Bonnie, it is um, an honor, honor to be in this room. Thank you. Just, I'd, I'd like to give you a quick comment. Dr. Ther Fer Therfelder, I hate to disagree with something that you just said. Let me get out of the speaker. Uh, Mike may not have known how to grow tomatoes. He may not have known how to grow corn. Probably didn't really know what okra was when he first got down here in the South. But Mike did something that touched every individual in this room. He planted a seed in your heart. There's no question about that. And these people here, you are a thimble full of the individuals that Mike Reedy touched. But I'm gonna share a story that involved my son. My son was an avid basketball player. He eat, drank, and slept basketball. At the age of eight, he was playing in four, maybe five leagues that year. But one of those happened to be St. Michael's and he was playing in the Joe Nelly League. A lot of you folks probably knew Coach Nelly. But these, it was an instructional league, and these kids enjoyed every minute of it. And my son enjoyed it more than any of the other leagues that he played in. That year, when they had their banquet, he was the recipient of the Joe Nelly Award, which was given to one student athlete that played in that league. The keynote speaker who presented that to my son, Matthew, was Mike Reedy. And here's an eight-year-old, and here's this looming, larger-than-life individual. Forget the stature, but he was that way anyhow. And Mike gave the most impassioned speech to these children. Well, my son is now 40 years of age, and it touched him, and it touched me. I didn't know Mike, didn't know Bonnie. Since then, I've become good friends with both Mike and Bonnie over the course of those 40 years. And in my phone, it has one contact, and that contact is Mike Bonnie, because you cannot separate those two individuals. They are mirror images of one another, and they touch all of us. So Mike grew a lot, Dr. Thierfelder. He grew a lot of seeds and a lot of hearts, and they're larger than this room could hold. And I mean that with all my sincerity. Thank you. All right, Kenny, we have, we have time for one more story. One more story, and then afterwards, the bar is going to be open for a little bit, but we have one more story. Well, this... Oh, 
This is a personal story, and Bonnie did give me permission to tell it. No, no, you don't want me to tell it? For sure? Okay, never mind. Okay, before I turn it back over to Abbott Placid, I got a call a few days ago from J.P. Collins. Many of you know J.P. Many of you were recruited by J.P. Collins. J.P. Collins graduated in 1972, went on to work in the admissions office in New York and New Jersey for 10, 15 years, then went on for a career at um, Sharp Electronics. He called last week because he was afraid to call Bonnie to say he couldn't come. That day, that day, J.P. went to play pickleball, and he was mixed doubles, and he got a partner, and he, the partner said, my name is Lisa, and he said, my name is J.P., and she said, oh, isn't that funny? The guy who recruited me to college, name was J.P., and he said, was it Collins? And she said, yes. He said, that was me. And she said, I came to Belmont Abbey. I was a recreation administration major. Mike Reedy was the director of the program at the time. She is now the director of recreation in Toms River, New Jersey, which is pretty impressive given the size of Toms River. But she said this, I owe everything to Dr. Mike Reedy. And I think I speak for many of you here tonight in saying that if you had Mike Reedy in your life, you are a better person for it. Abbott, thank you. There's one sort of parenthesis here out of the, the wake. Um, someone who is here this morning left their glasses here. Of course, you probably can't see them if you, these are yours, but <laughs> if you're having trouble seeing and you sort of don't have the glasses on, you might want to see me and check these out. But, Bonnie, you said that you were worried that you weren't able when Mike passed to have a wake because of the pandemic. And you felt like you had to do that for him. Thank you, you've done it marvelously for us this evening. And the important thing about good people is when they go on to their reward, they're not gone. Because what they've done, the lives they've touched, the people they've, they've formed, carry on that good work. And it continues, and it continues down really through generations. And so we're grateful, Bonnie, for you and Mike with us, for that good man who taught us to do the right thing and has passed that on to countless players and students, to all of us here, and that will endure unto life eternal. And so this is awake, so we're going to close with a prayer here. It's the seventh day of Easter, and in that hope that this good man, who by baptism became a son of God, has now gone to that reward the Lord promises to his good servants. And we look forward to one day when there are no longer any farewells to have these stories going on forever. And after we finish here, so the bar will be open, please continue the stories tonight down through the next years at coming reunions to keep these wonderful memories of this wonderful man alive. So let us pray. Eternal God, you made the union of husband and wife a sign of the bond between Christ and the church. Grant peace and mercy to Mike, who is united in love with his wife, Bonnie. May the care and devotion of his life on earth find a lasting reward in heaven. Look kindly now on his wife, his family, us, his friends, as we now turn to your compassion and love. Strengthen our faith and lighten our loss, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We've got...